My thanks to Professor Joyita Shengupto for inviting me to present this talk at the 5th Annual International Conference of Cesure Collective sponsored by ICSSR ERC. The title of my talk is The Politics of Rhizomatic Translation in Abhunindranath Thakur's Illustrations of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. One way of thinking about a post-colonial utopia, or rather heterotopia, is as a global rhizomatic, many-to-many, -many, dynamic and improvisatory translation project. But the celebratory communitas this gestures towards is hardly the reality of our post-colonial times, still very much under the domination of models of absolutism, which are neo-colonial. Here, contemporary neocolonialism must be understood not merely as the world market universalizing the ontology of capital. Behind the colonization of capital stands epistemic colonialism, the discursive and teleological standards that dictate the norms and terms of translation. In the post-World War II phase of world history, the chapter of political colonialism came to an end, but economic and epistemic colonialism continued, with independent nation-states standing guarantee to the colonialism of capital and thought. If the neocolonialism of capital continues to proliferate globally through post-national corporations, epistemic colonialism has seen interesting mutations in the virus of colonial modernity with which post-colonial nations were infected through the operational model of the nation-state. Nationalisms inaugurated their challenge to colonialism in the name of difference. The emergence of nationalism opened up a plural and liminal space of difference which formed a strategic alliance against a common enemy. But in replacing the authority of the enemy, the nation found itself occupying the apparatus of governmentality through epistemic control, which forced a transformation on the liminality and plurality of alliance to a contractual and competitive hierarchic politics of organization in terms of a center and relative distances from it, leading to the margins and further to zones of exile and erasure. Difference here was normalized and nominalized and either forced to operate as cultural flavors of modernity, a monoculturalism or multiculturalism, or through populist fascism or military imposition, turned to a state imperialism of normalized difference. Our present phase of post-colonial modernity demonstrates a swell of the last kind of epistemic self-colonization. In all these varieties of postmodern and postcolonial existence, the ontology of language culture continues to insist on controlled transmission, in other words, translation within authorized epistemic and teleological boundaries obeying a source copy hierarchy. Of course, all translation is transcreation and all translation is political but this is most often unconsciously so. Zones of untranslatability between cultures and media force the translator to exercise creativity to convey meaning, and selection choices in the translation of polysemous suggestions in the source convey both psychological and political biases. However, it is when these are both more consciously exercised that the hierarchic transmission model of source and copy begins to be challenged. Even here though, as highlighted by Foucault and others, the epistemic dispositive over-determines the discursive envelope so as to permit distinct positions and oppositions. But this is also an opportunity for the subversive power of transcreation to exploit the zones of untranslatability so as to insert windows of alternative worlding, folding the text to new metaphysical and teleological vistas. To enable this, however, it is important to shift the model of translation 
from the hierarchic or arboretic to the rhizomatic as theorized by Deleuze and Guattari in A Thousand Plateaus. How can one escape the authority of a source text to make such a shift? To effect this, one has to realize that Deleuze and Guattari challenge the statism or statism of modernity through an ontology of becoming. What may help us also is Heidegger's insistence on a shift from a hermeneutics of the text to a hermeneutics of the event, erectness. In an ontology of becoming, texts circulate and multiply in variant versions adapted to local and temporal processes of collective individuation. Cultural imaginaries converse with one another, generating new hybrids. Sites of semiotic approximation but semantic difference become occasions for the birth of multivocality which modifies the ensuing reception of the original and the translation, stripping both of fixity and making them available in a continuous process without finality. This is the image of the rhizome which taps into the virtual plurality of a text, complicating its authority by invoking a past and inserting a future into its accepted understanding and relativizing it to an instance in an expanding unfinished archive. One sees this often in the transmission of pre-modern and non-canonical oral texts. A good case in point is the Mahabharata, which even in its canonical version codes a narrative multiplicity and ambiguity of source. The Mahabharata became fixed perhaps around the Gupta period, 4th to 6th century CE, but to this day a variety of narrative variants continue to renew and expand its multiplicity in oral and performative traditions. Hybridity, according to Mikhail Bakhtin, can be of two kinds, organic and intentional. Organic hybridity marks a natural encounter of cultures which coexist without power relations of domination. Intentional hybridity occurs in cultures of power inequality where the result of the encounter codes for gestures of political affirmation. As mentioned earlier here, Modern nationalism has often inaugurated its challenge to colonialism in the name of the inclusive plural histories and subjects of the nation and a future of expanding identities of the conversation of cultural imaginaries. But in attaining political freedom, the epistemic condition of categoric identities took over, replacing the liminality of plural becoming with the perpetual contestation of identity politics. It is thus necessary to realize that political freedom is not epistemic and or ontological freedom and that intersubjective acts of culture in the name of plural identities are continuously necessary at the level of lived communities to challenge the epistemic conditioning of postmodernity. It is here that a closer look at examples of rhizomatic translation from early nationalism may help us with models of communitarian political affirmation necessary to our times. I propose to look at some examples of this kind from the Omar Khayyam series of paintings by Abhinindranath Thakur, which he completed during the Swadeshi period between 1906 to 1910. Abhinindranath's series of 12 paintings from the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam were published in 1910 as a portfolio from London illustrating specific verses of the poem as translated by Edward Fitzgerald. This is an important series in the oeuvre of Abhinindranath as it signals the emergence of a self-confident style in his life as an artist. Historically, the paintings represent the assimilation of a few events that occurred between 1897 and 1902, such as the encounter with E.B. Havel, the Indophile British principal of the Government School of Art in Calcutta, leading to Abhinindranath's establishment 
as the vice principal of the school in 1905. And the encounter with the Japanese Pan Asian ideologue Okakura Kakuzo and the two principal artists of his school of art, Yokoyama Taikan and Hishida Shunso. What is common about these encounters is the challenge to the canon of Western naturalistic painting that they represented. Through Havel, Abunindranath felt justified in his forays into Indian traditions of painting and came into contact with British circles related to the arts and crafts movement, which was countercultural to the values of modernity and through which his series of paintings was published. The choice of the Rubaiyat must also be seen as partly determined by this affiliation, since it was a favorite Orientalist text in its version as translated by Fitzgerald and painted by a number of British artists, including Edward Burne Jones in circa 1870. From the Japanese ideologue and painters, Abunindranath acquired an idealism related to the need for an emerging pan-Asian subjectivity that could take fluid cultural positions, and he adapted a wash technique that allowed him to express a contemplative atmosphere of non-dualism in which his characters were steeped. Okakura's text, The Ideals of the East, written in the Tagore household, began with the oft-quoted line, Asia is one, and identified a mystic non-dualism, Advaita, as the basis for this cultural oneness. The Pan-Asian resonance of the Rubaiyat as a West Asian text should not be lost sight of. Whether the verses of the Rubaiyat are the work of a skeptic or a mystic is a matter still debated, with the weight of opinion resting on the former view. Fitzgerald's translation privileges a romantic Epicurean skepticism. The Tagores were well versed in Persian, and though it is unknown if Abunindranath had read Omar Khayyam in the original, both Rabindranath and Abunindranath had read the poet Hafiz in Persian. Hafiz had written a rubaiyat of his own, using similar Sufi tropes of wine, romance, and transience to convey his mystical messages, and Abunindranath's choice of the rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam must be seen as doubled and extended by this text. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, the historicity of this series includes the inception of the Swadeshi movement in 1905. Abunindranath participated with his uncle Robindranath and the other Tagores of Jorashako in some of the Swadeshi events, but more importantly, it awoke in him the question of the national subject. It is to be noted here that the Tagores were outcast Hindus, popularly referred to as Pirali Brahmins, due to the conversion of some of their ancestors to Islam. This hybridity, with its braiding of culture and nature, was never far from the national concerns of Abunindranath and has to be seen among the influences of his choice for a Persian classic, the Rubaiyat. The continuum of subject positions operating in Abunindranath's visual translation of the Urbayat can thus be seen as his conception for the subjective space of the emerging nation. The hybrid Bengali Muslim, the Pan-Asian ranging from East Asian to West Asian, united through non-dual mysticisms, the entire tradition of Indian spirituality and the countercultural British Indophile who challenged the post-Renaissance canon with aesthetic ideals drawn from the colonies. In the rhizomatic politics of visual translation, these subject positions communicated, informing and transforming one another and the versions of the Rubaiyat that belonged to each without privileging any origin or finality. Fitzgerald is one of those singled out by Edward Said for the Orientalist imperialism of his translation. In choosing to illustrate his verses, Abunindranath exercises the hermeneutics of intentional hybridity 
by bringing in the non-dual mysticism of Hafiz as part of the cultural virtuality of the text. Similarly, he interposes the Bengali Muslim woman in Sari or the East Asian sage in meditation into his visual translations, pluralizing its subjective space. For lack of time, I will consider here two paintings as examples of Avanindranath's rhizomatic translation. We start with verse 50 of Fitzgerald's translation. It reads, The ball no question makes of eyes and nose, but right or left as strikes the player goes. And he that tossed thee down into the field, he knows all about it, he knows, he knows. The lines express the fatalism of an instrumentalized condition in the hands of an unknown creator and his unknown motives. The human being is the plaything of time and circumstance. In other quatrains, this helplessness and uncertainty becomes the ground for the call to enjoy the moment symbolized by drink and romance. In the painting, there is no ball or player. In an almost uniform pitch dark background, with no difference between sky and water, we find a narrow boat with a kneeling old man wearing dark robes, his bearded head lowered. In front of him, a cat plays with a toppled, round-bottomed flask. Above and disappearing from the top center of the image is the bottom part of a faint full moon. It is the light of this moon that shines on the bald head of the man and his grey eyebrows and beard and provides highlights for the cat and flask. This subtle use of single source lighting is a recognition of the Western canon of illusionism while subjecting it to the two-dimensional flatness of the wash. Behind the old man is an open book. The shape of the boat and the appearance and attitude of the old man are reminiscent of paintings of scholar poets and sages common to East Asia. The figure could equally be a Sufi sage, whether from Persia or India. Several members of the Tagore household, including Rabindranath and the brothers Gohanindranath and Abhinindranath, fashioned themselves sartorially in the ambiguous image of a Sufi or a Taoist by donning a loose robe or jubba designed by Gagodindranath. The sage thus could be seen as coding for an alter ego of the artist himself. The somber darkness with the boat adrift on black waters and the sage seated in contemplation uncaring of the direction of movement is another image of subjective transcendence in the face of uncertainty. The painting makes use not only of the wash adapted from the Nihonga Japanese artists, but very distinctly of compositional elements learned from the Japanese. After his return to Japan, Okakura regularly sent copies of the art journal Kokka, which he had founded and which contained prints of Japanese art through history. Abhinindranath studied these journals and we find a variety of echoes of different Japanese and Chinese periods and styles in his work. The one corner emphasis of the boat and sage is an art historical echo going back to the Chinese Ma Xia school of the Southern Sung dynasty and its later adaptations in the art of Japan through such masters as Tawaraya Sotatsu, active late 16th to early 17th centuries. Since we see only about three quarters of the boat, we have no idea of whether there is a boatman steering the craft. Like the boat, we see also only the lower half of the full moon. This truncation of figures, indicating not an illusion of completeness, but a window into infinite reality, was also a Japanese compositional practice going back to artists like Sotatsu, and in this case, heightens a philosophic sense of uncertainty, since we realize 
that we can know only a slice and not the whole of reality at any time. The cat playing with the flask gives an impression of pushing it hither and thither and awakens a visual echo of Fitzgerald's line about the ball. The roundness of the flask reinforces this sense of the ball and the cat can be seen then as the unconventional player referred to in the line. The cat's purposeless play with the flask accentuates the sense of randomness in the play far more effectively than have, having a human player with a ball. The flask is also a reference to the wine that left unmentioned in this quatrain. Thus, in the visual translation, it is not the man but the wine which is the plaything of circumstance. This play with the flask also connects us to the next line, since the flask appears to have been tossed down by the old man. Hence, we are left with our attention focused on the old sage in mystic contemplation of randomness. He knows, he knows, through transcendence. Thus, the painting opens up a virtuality of cult cultural multivocality, pointing to Advaitic, Sufi, Taoist, and Zen practices of meditation and resources of transcendence to evoke a version of the text belonging to the extended subjectivity of the emerging nation, which calls for the confrontation with modernity as a future cut adrift from the structures of past meaning. As a second example, we may consider verse 7, which is more explicit about the central message of the Rubaiyat, hedonism as the anodyne of fleeting time. The verse goes, Come fill the cup, and in the fire of spring, the winter garment of repentance fling. The bird of time has but a little way to fly, and lo, the bird is on the wing. Avanindranath's visual translation here sidesteps the particulars of the verse almost completely. Instead, he shows us the single figure of a young woman awaiting her lover at night. The only continuity with the verse is the bird keeping her company. The image of the woman reminds us at once of Sanskrit classical tradition of Naikas, a virahini, a lover separated from her beloved. The bird or nightingale, bulbul in Persian, a bird found also in India, is a repeating symbol in the poetic text and in the Naika context reminds one of Indian sculptures and paintings of Yakshis and Naikas with birds on their shoulders, which Avanindranath must have been familiar with through his contact with Havel. In this classical image, the bird serves as a playful pet, heightening the sense of eros as play. This is no doubt one of the uses of the bird in Avanindranath's translation. The bird in Sufi literature has been internalized in other ways by Rabindranath in his poetry and through him by Avanindranath. Rabindranath's Sufi bulbul had become conflated with the baul bird of the heart Monir Paki, the internal aspiration or yearning for transcendence. The Virahini Naika then repeats the trope of transience, alienation and transcendence through mystic yearning. The Naika trope is another of the memes mentioned above through which Rasa aesthetics had transmitted itself in pan-Indian contexts. Naikas and their moods were assimilated into Vaishnavism through the Brindaban Goswamis in the 16th century, so that the Virahini has a specific place in Vaishnav eschatology as the separated soul yearning for union with the transcendent seen as the beloved. Since a similar affective eschatology informed Sufism, Avanindranath's Virahini enacts the transcendence of separation alienation and transience in Indian, Persian, and again Japanese cultural vocabularies and practices. Whereas in Fitzgerald's verse, the bird is the symbol of hastening time, 
reenacting the transient's theme. In Ogunindranath's translated response, it serves an almost inverse function, that of keeping time as against losing time. The bird waits with the Virahini, keeping her company till the arrival of her lover. In the ontology of colonialism, Fitzgerald's image, as well as his choice and translation, reinforce an escape or bypassing through a response of frivolity to the condition of subjection to the accelerated instrumentalization of modern clock time, while Abhinindranath inverts this temporal response by a gathering and conservation of time, the messianic time of waiting for opportunity and apocalypse. Thus, in these paintings, we see how Abhinindranath exercises a micropolitics of rhizomatic translation to open a space of fluid subjectivity for the individual subject of the emerging nation in response to colonialism and modernity with their properties of bondage, transience, alienation, and uncertainty. He finds the subject positions of this space not in the assumption of individual autonomy, nor in a decadent romantic orientalism, but in specific historically located and homologous traditions of practice embedded in a variety of cultural habitat. He often uses a dialogic orientalist frame to address the Western or Westernized subject of modernity, but displaces the orientalist gaze through a variety of creative mistranslations which attempt to reinscribe native and pan-Asian understandings and practices through a politics of intentional hybridity. These examples of rhizomatic translation are useful for us in our times in honing strategies for a revolutionary hermeneutics of translation.